Delegate from Norfolk, Delegate Glass. Gratitude, Mr. Speaker. I rise for a point of personal privilege. The delegate has the floor. Gratitude, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, how many times have you broken your mother's heart? Hmm. Me? <laughs> how many times? You know, growing up, I never desired children, um, and that sentiment actually manifested in some very severe postpartum depression for about two years of my son's life. I could never really understand why I was so upset until I recently started reading this book called The Three Mothers, how the mothers of Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, and James Baldwin shaped our nation by a woman named Anna Malika Tubbs. So you have Alberta King, uh, Louise Little, and Bertus Baldwin. These are really not household names. It's not something that, something that people know. Tubbs in this book reminds me, or reminds us, I hope, if you get the opportunity to read it, that their mother's exposure to the very racist, very sexist, very violent America deeply informed how they raised their little citizens. Malcolm X kind of said it best. He said a mother is the first teacher of a child. The message that she gives to that child, that child gives to the world. Alberta King, Louise Little, and Bertus Baldwin in black American history bore the weight of being a martyr's mother. Recognizing them as martyr's mother doesn't necessarily mean we overlook their individual paths they blazed as women. But in reality, Martin's connection to the black church was deeply rooted in Alberta's steadfast belief in God. Alberta was born right up the street from Ebenezer Baptist Church where she established the choir, where she played the organ, and her upbringing was influenced by her parents who served as really early members of the NAACP and they were actively engaged in organizing strategy meetings and confronting injustices. Alberta was murdered six years after her son was assassinated, shot dead, playing the Lord's Prayer on the organ at Ebenezer Baptist Church. Now Malcolm's mama, Louise, she originally came from Grenada and we know that island is known for a history of resistance she ended up coming to America solo and becoming a significant associate of Marcus Garvey. This woman was multilingual, educated her children in multiple languages, and Malcolm can be, uh, is on record saying that once she, she would keep dictionaries and newspaper clippings on the table, which she would educate all of them on and teach, reteach the inaccuracies that were taught to them by their European American teachers. Louise lived 26 years beyond her son's assassination without offering a book or speaking a word about his death. Bertus Baldwin, this woman's notes that she sent to school were highly regarded by teachers and principals alike. And I'm not gonna say they were fascinated because she was an educated black woman, but we can read between the lines of their fascination. In the book, they talk about how her birthday messages were considered amongst the most beautiful things written by her grandbabies to her grandbabies and her babies. Her son, when he moved to France for refuge from the racism and the homophobia he encountered here in the US, she decided to maintain regular correspondence with him. And he became a beautiful writer and poet. Alberta, Louise, and Bertus nurtured a sense of love in their children that, during that era, acted as a form of resistance, Mr. Speaker, in its own right. Inspire Malcolm to dream, I mean, aspiring Martin to dream, Malcolm to speak, and James to write. And unfortunately, in that regard, Mr. Speaker, not much has changed. The resistance positioned them to live beyond, the, to live to bury their sons. And I cry, and I've cried some days not knowing, uh, not about their deaths, but because I don't know how to teach my son how to face the world and change the world at the same time sometimes. 
like Alberta Louise and Bertis, there is a protective mother in me that has sort of curated these practices designed to help my little citizens move to avoid racism. There's a resistance mother in me that actively promotes this sort of positive self-image that I want my babies to see themselves to be. The encumbered mother in me is constantly hyper aware of how the risk how the risk that racism poses on them on a daily basis. And for all the protection, Mr. Speaker, and for all the resistance and all the encumbering, it still won't change the fact that we are still creating American history, rather black American history, from a place of generational trauma. Why did I bring a child here, I ask myself sometimes. And I don't want to bring up old stuff because I'm a so what, now what kind of woman, and I, you, you are so what, you know, what kind of man. I want to move on, but American history is tethered to our hearts. Learning that your foremothers, my foremothers, Alberta, Bertus's, and Louise's mothers for motherhood, they, it had very little to do with their will or their choice and more to do with American, European American man's economic needs. They didn't have the power of choice. Fannie Lou Hamer, Hamer said it best when I think about black motherhood and where we've been and where we're going. We were the only race in America that had our babies sold from our breast. And had mothers sold from their babies. of the three mothers remind us that like black marriage, black parenthood, especially motherhood, it is awe-inspiring and extremely vulnerable, Mr. Speaker, when, black, when a black woman is able to choose when to bring black children into this world on her own accord. It is revo it's a revolutionary act and connected to merit because it's connected to American history. When she is able to raise her children or choose to prioritize her children over obligations outside of the home, in many ways, it's an incredible feat. This complicated relationship between black women and their children is still affected. by America's darkest sin, maritime and domestic human trafficking of Africans, and the incessant pressure to rise above every trope, Mr. Speaker, the negative matriarch, the welfare queen, the Jezebel, the mammy. I don't want to be Martin's, Malcolm's, or James's mother. I don't want to be Trayvon's mother, or Tamar, T Tamir's mother, or Philando's mother, or Eddie's, uh, Freddie's, excuse me, Freddie's mother, or Alton's mother. But I do want to, in these moments, change the words of my heart. I pray sometimes that my son doesn't make history. But then I look at you, and I pray that he does. What did Helen Scott go through? How many times did you break her heart? And she follow up with her version of love. Helen, just like Alberta, Louise, and Bertus, built a son that made history, but he got to live to tell her about it. And for that, Mr. Speaker, gratitude. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.